A very good morning to everyone. My name is Nicholas Reed from Reed Corporate. And on behalf of Astro Resources, ASX ticker ARO, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this special investor webinar this morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Well, Astro is very much a company on the move uh, following a significant rejuvenation in recent months with the installation of a new board and management team, recapitalization and the addition of some exciting new projects. It's my great pleasure this morning to have on this webinar the company's executive chairman who joins us from Sydney, Tony Leibovitz, and general manager exploration, Matt Healy, who joins us from Brisbane. Rather than do a conventional presentation page turn, we're going to do a Q&A format this morning, supported by limited slides, and then open the floor to questions from, inve from investors. So without further ado, we'll jump straight into it. And Tony, if, if I could please start with you. Thanks very much for joining us. Good to see you this morning. Uh, thanks for having me, Nick, Nicholas. Tony, if you could give us a quick overview of your involvement with the company, its, it's recent history, and just bring us up to speed with what's happened in the last few months. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, oh, good morning, Matt. I haven't spoken to you yet. Uh, <laughs> Morning. Not sure whether investors or shareholders. No, <clears throat> I'm a recent. Um, uh, I'm recently appointed to the board of Astro. What happened was I, I was offered an opportunity to have a look at these assets. I, I saw a company that had had a history of being having a, a fairly scattergun approach. Uh, my history is such that I, I'm quite opportunistic in what I see and what I like. And I'll only get involved if I can take a meaningful stake. I saw a number of assets. I saw a board that I think, after some adjustment, could be um, changed, uh, and hopefully bring along some of my my friends, associates, investors that have shared in my successes over time. So it, it was really opportunistic, and I think we've made some significant change. Uh, this change will continue um, with perhaps some asset disposals, some maybe perhaps name changes, and we'll see ourselves going forward from that point. Thanks, Tony. If, if you could give us a little bit more background on some of the key players now involved, um, and I'd, I thought it worth mentioning, of course, many people know you, yourself and, and, and John Young, uh, who joined the board recently, were involved in establishing Pilbara and the great success story that Pilbara turned out to be. Can you give us a, a bit of insight into what sort of, what attracted you to Astro, what opportunities with that in mind that you see for the company? Well, I, I think Astro, as I say, I don't know much about its history, but I, I've worked with John. Uh, I've actually, oops, sorry, my screen's gone on to, went blank again. I've worked with John Young. Uh, him and I were heavily involved in Pilbara. Vince, funnily enough, I'd had some work done for me when he was a, a partner at an accounting firm. He did some independent experts report. Um, the, the, the previous board had none of these directors. The only remaining director is Vince. It had four other directors who have all um, subsequently moved on. More importantly, I have the opportunity of working with Matt, who I've had, I'm now into my second, probably close to third year uh, of experience with, and it's it's an absolute pleasure working with him. Technically very strong. He loves the assets. He's easy to work with. Uh, I, I see him being a critical part of our uh, organisation. We've got a, a highly technical team as well as a very commercial team. So it's uh, it's it's a good it's a good mix. Thanks, Tony. Just before we dive into some detail with Matt, just a quick a quick view from you on on lithium. It's an exciting space at the moment. Um, what what's your take on on the outlook for the sector? Um, funnily enough, I actually mentioned this a little bit earlier. City Corp have brought out a very bullish uh, report on lithium. But Morningstar, who are probably the most independent of research companies that I've come across, talk about lithium, there being a shortage of lithium concentrate at least for the next decade and see an average uh, lithium concentrate price of around about 
forty thousand uh, dollars per ton. So. Uh, who am I to say where it's all going? I know EV motor vehicles have got a long way to go. Within the next five to 10 years, they should comprise around 40% of car sales. I, I just see there continuing to be a shortage, and we like what we've got. We've actually got some projects which will have a much lower cost to produce than the traditional spodumene or hard rock lithium and um, brine lithium. Thanks, Tony. Well, that's a great segue into to Matt. So, Matt, well, welcome to you this morning. Um, can you start by just giving us a quick snapshot of, of where Astro's projects are and what's going on at those projects at the moment? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Nicholas. Thanks for having us here uh, this morning. Yeah, so there's there's, um, there's three key projects that sit on Astro um, in, in North America. We're exploring for claystone-hosted lithium deposits in Nevada, which is a, it really is uh, the hot spot uh, for lithium exploration in North America. In Southwest WA, uh, we have a, the Governor Broom uh, deposit, and that's where we're advancing a, what's a largely de-risked um, heavy mineral sands uh, resource development project. Uh, it's got 126 uh, million tons of jork resources currently, and uh, we're advancing uh, that project through a scoping study early next year. Uh, and the third one rounding out the stable is the Georgina project. Uh, that's where we're exploring a new uh, copper gold frontier, uh, namely, and it's, it's, it sits between the historical mining regions of Tennant Creek and, and the Northern Territory and uh, Mount Isa, of course, in Northwest Queensland. Um, and that's, that's, that's where, why the, the project was staked. But there's actually some new information coming out from Geoscience Australia uh, that is showing it's also perspective for, for world-class uh, lead zinc deposits a bit further east in the project area. So that's that's pretty exciting. So that's a diversified portfolio, Matt. Um, I'll just remind everyone who's tuning in that if you do have any questions once we finish this little introduction, um, any investors and shareholders are welcome to post questions using the Q&A tab on the right hand side of your screen. But Matt, uh, the, the action recently has, has been from a, the drilling of your projects in Nevada in the US. Can you can you take us through what's been going on there? Sure, sure. Well, we've drilled, um, yeah, we're in the middle of a, of a drill program at the moment. Uh, we've drilled four air core holes to date. Uh, we've got four more to go. Uh, and um, what we've been targeting there is uh, these lithium claystones. Now these, um, they differ. They're quite a bit different from the pegmatite uh, deposits that we're familiar with here in Australia. Uh, and if you um, really, people have only been exploring these for the last few years. And they're, they're broad, they tend to be thick, flat lying deposits. And uh, for that reason, they offer some benefits from a mining perspective. Typically, you have a lower strip ratio, uh, these, these projects. So you're, you're mining a lot less waste um, compared to the amount for every tonne of ore. And they also have lower processing costs. You know, ASX-listed Iron Ear, uh, they, they're at the bottom of the cost curve for, for lithium um, production on, on a lithium carbonate equivalent basis. So, and they're just, they're just uh, uh, to the southwest of us, about 50 k's away. Um, the other thing is lithium carbonate, it's actually sell at a premium over spodumene in terms of a product. And, that, and that's because with spodumene, which comes out of your hard rock uh, deposits, it's, there's another whole step uh, to turn that into something that's useful for, um, for battery feedstock. So that extra step, that's another uh, profit margin, and, and thus you get a premium for, for lithium carbonate over, over spodumene concentrate. And look, and the, and the other thing too is uh, the federal government in the US is very keen on, um, on developing a domestic uh, battery manufacturing supply chain. And that goes right from the, from the mining, processing, battery manufacture, uh, right through to recycling. And they've invested, they've put their money where their mouth is on that one. And um, they're, they're serious about getting uh, that up and running in the US. So, so we've staked... Two, two projects in the area and, and on the map on your screen for, for everyone that's uh, watching, the two areas in red, Polaris and Altair. And they're just down the valley from two quite significant uh, lithium uh, deposits. American Lithium, which is the one located in the north, 
It's uh, a 9.79 million ton lithium carbonate equivalent resource. And the one just southwest of that is uh, American Battery Technology. So that's a 15.8 million ton lithium carbonate equivalent resource. And if you're not familiar with the terminology, I'll give you a comparison uh, to a pegmatite project. The, the American Batteries project has 80% more contained lithium metal than what Pilbara Minerals have as per their last mineral resource. So these, these, these are big deposits. They are really are the, the, the giants of the, uh, of the lithium deposit classes. So we're exploring the same claystone, just a bit further south in the valley. And to get back to your question, uh, Nicholas, uh, we've, we've drilled four holes to date. Uh, three of those have intersected that claystone. Um, we've sent uh, a bunch of uh, samples off for assay. And the, look, the only hole that didn't intersect the claystone uh, is one that we had to pull up early. So we suspect if we, if we go back and we re-drill that to full depth, that we should intersect claystone. That's a very interesting uh, scale comparison, Matt. And I think we might have another slide on the on the lithiums to, to have a look at as well, um, just showing your drilling in progress. Is it true to say that the, the, the time frame to develop a resource with this style of deposit is much quicker than a hard rock deposit as well? Yeah, look, I, I think the value proposition for shareholders and, and for those considering to become you know, shareholders in, in the company is um, it goes back to that geology because they're broad and they're they're they're, they're, they're big deposits and they they're pretty continuous. It means that they're relatively inexpensive to explore for because you don't need to drill every twenty meters in these things. Um, American Battery Tech, the, the the resource I quoted before, I mean they've put out that inferred resource earlier this year. They did that on the back of twenty two drill holes drilled in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two. So. As long as we've got the same sort of geological continuity, and we don't expect there's any, there's any, don't see any reason to see otherwise. I mean, that's the kind of time frame that we're looking at, um, at working towards in terms of defining lithium resources in Nevada as well. Fantastic, uh, Matt. And um, so the next news flow from this project we can expect in the coming weeks. Yeah, look, um, we uh, can expect assays in about. Uh, six weeks time, the uh, the labs in Nevada are pretty flat out. There's been a real a boom in exploration for these uh, kinds of deposits. And uh, but yeah, in about six weeks, so um, early um, early July, we should expect uh, results, um, initial results for this program. But look, don't forget, we're we're still drilling. We're drilling down at Altair. That's at the southern of the two uh, projects. So we should be putting some results out from that drilling in due course as well. And look, I might take the opportunity too to mention our regional uh, reconnaissance program. So we've said before uh, that we're very keen on expanding our footprint in Nevada. And uh, look, we've backed that up. Uh, we've been doing, in fact, I just came back from Nevada about uh, two weeks ago, uh, conducted a, a reconnaissance program over a number of what we deem high priority areas across the state. Uh, we've taken a bunch of surface samples and before we stake ground, we want to see what's in those surface samples. Uh, but we're very, we're very bullish that we're going to be staking a new project or at least one new project uh, out of that work. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. Um, we might uh, jump across now to WA and just ask you to quickly take you through the Governor Broom project, which does seem to be a sizable asset that probably sits a bit under the radar in your portfolio. Can you yeah, explain yeah, to shareholders what the opportunity is? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, uh, look, it's we've got a pretty substantial um, jork resources at Governor Brome, 126 million tonnes uh, of um, mainly inferred resources, 4.3% heavy mineral content. That's a, that's a good grade. It's a high grade. And the mineral assemblage that's in that heavy mineral um, concentrate uh, contains high value minerals like zircon, uh, like rutile, and it's, it's actually got a little bit of monazite, which is a rare earth uh, containing mineral as well. Uh, the project's located and really in the heart of uh, mineral sands country, sealed roads to the project, uh, access to power, and we're within 135 k's of two mineral sands processing plants. So it really is a, a great spot to be. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've just, just completed an infill drilling program at Governor Broome. And the reason we did that is because we had some areas of the resource that uh, were inferred, and you can see them in the areas uh, in yellow, on the on the map on your screen 
the aim was to upgrade those from inferred to indicated. So we drilled just over 500 drill holes. It was completed uh, uh, not that long ago. It was announced, I think, earlier in the month. And uh, that paves the way for a mineral resource update in Q3. And once we've got that mineral resource update and you've got in indicated resources across the bulk of the project, we'll be progressing that to a scoping study, which is re really where we'll start to realise the value in this project. And Nicholas, if I could just jump in at this stage, sure. uh, it, it wouldn't be our intention to to operate the mineral sands project. That's not where our strengths lie. Uh, we see this uh, Jack Track um, Governor Broom as certainly underpinning the market cap of, of, of Astra at the moment. In fact, probably after the scoping study is completed, probably double what our current market price might be. Uh, our current market cap, sorry. So, but I don't think investors or interested parties should be concerned that we will be spreading ourselves too thin because we will be focusing on the battery metal side of things. And this would be an absolute must for other operators. Thanks, Tony. That's uh, that's that's a good point. A shareholder or an investor has asked, actually, and it might be a good point to deal with this question about how you rank your the various projects in terms of priority and attractiveness, given you have a diversified portfolio. Um, good question. I, I mean, I'm 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 single-minded. I'm sort of obsessive obsessively focused on controlling that which we can control. So I think we've, we've determined that our skill set really sits around lithium IOCG style projects. I've inherited, we, sorry, the shareholders have inherited the mineral sands. Initially, uh, I was a bit perplexed as to why we had it. I now understand the value proposition that this brings and gives me the security that it underpins our market cap. So, um, Matt, maybe you want to uh, elaborate on what I've just said? Yeah, sure. Look, it's a, um, it, it is indeed a, um, a legacy asset, let's call it that, from, from, from Astro. But when we've taken a look at it, Nicholas, as Tony sort of alluded to, you realise pretty quickly there's a lot of value here. I mean, um, it's got proven... Uh, heavy mineral separation performance. And in fact, uh, the Zircon uh, product that came out of test work at Governor Broome actually met the requirements for premium classification in the, in the, in the ceramic sector. Uh, and the ceramic sector, it's, that's, the, that's where the bulk of uh, Zircon uh, mined worldwide goes. So we can expect a, a premium price to come from that. And uh, from Jack, Jack Track, which is the eastern part of the deposit, over 10.5% of the mineral content is, um, is zircon and the heavy mineral sands, um, uh, heavy mineral concentrate part of the deposit. So that that's uh, and that's selling for over 2,000 US a ton at the moment. So it's a high value product. When you're talking about 10.5% of it, that's uh, $200 uh, worth of value in your heavy mineral concentrate just from that mineral alone. Fantastic. Um, well, perhaps, uh, Matt, if, you, if we had sort of transition into the third project, just briefly, Georgina, it's an asset you acquired from Greenvale, I believe. Um, tell sure. us a bit about, about that. Yeah, so uh, Georgina is located between uh, Mount Isa and Tennant Creek. Uh, both of those areas, historical base metal mining district, mainly copper and gold in, uh, in Tennant Creek. Uh, but copper, gold, lead, zinc uh, at Mount Isa. Uh, it's one of the, the premier base metals districts in the world. And the uh, Geoscience Australia sunk a lot of money into the region in, in geoscience investigations and uh, worked out that the, the area in between the two was perspective for IOCG mineralisation. And so, as you can see by the map on the screen, there was a bit of a modern day gold rush, uh, people staking tenements, and uh, the areas in green uh, are... are uh, uh, Astro's tenements in the region. It's a very prospective ground and uh, historical, uh, sorry, a recent drilling that we've conducted has actually identified uh, anomalism, uh, copper mineralization and uh, uranium mineralization in the central part of the tenements, which is very encouraging. There's really only been about uh, probably about 20, 25 uh, private sector holes drilled into this whole region. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a very encouraging result for us. 
and the early stage. Uh, but if you look to the eastern part of the deposit, uh, part of the project, sorry, uh, those two tenements out to the east, and I'll just move the slide over here. Um, that map on the right, it's a heat map. This is produced by Geoscience Australia. And this is looking at, this is countrywide uh, mapping that, that Geoscience Australia put out. It's looking for prospectivity of, of large zinc and lead um, and silver uh, base metal deposits, sedimentary hosted base metal deposits. And this mapping only came out in the last couple of months. We've been saying that these two tenements were prospective for deposits like Century, like um, like Mount Isa, and uh, you know, and these are big deposits. You know, Mount Isa has been was discovered in 1923, so that's uh, that's a it's a hundred years old this year, and it's got a mining history going back that far. Century, for example, contains you know 13.7 million tons of zinc metal. So these are big deposits, and um, so it's great to see the mapping come out from Geoscience Australia, back up what we've been saying, and we've just kicked off a geophysical survey in that region. A gravity survey and uh, some passive seismic and that's basically to look for density variations under uh, under cover and that some of those density variations could actually be caused by sulfide mineralization so we'll be very keen to see the results of that uh, and the passive seismic part of it is to looking at constraining how, how deep the cover is so that we know when we look at to go drilling in this area which could be as early as later this year and uh, we'll know what we're um we know what we're dealing with Fantastic. Um, well, look, I think that's been a, a really good overview of the assets, and uh, and I think Tony's also given us a, a good understanding of the value proposition as he sees it. So we might take a couple of the questions that have come in from the webinar platform. Um, there are a few questions here, so I might just sort of combine a couple of them. Um, there's a there's a couple around the backdrop for the background of the projects in the US. Can you give us a bit of a, a sense, Matt, of the, the history of uh, how you acquired these assets and also what it's like operating in that part of the US? Is there, are there any environmental issues? What's the permitting regime like and so on? Sure. Look, uh, Nevada is an interesting place to operate because it operates under some very old uh, mining law. In fact, we have to to, to these projects, we talk about staking projects. We literally have to stake these projects. We go out and we put um, corner posts in the ground every uh, 1,500 uh, by uh, 500 feet. And uh, so we have to stake out, you know, 500 of these claims before we get on the ground and do significant work. Uh, but look, Nevada is a great place to operate in the sense of the um, the regulatory regime is is very black and white so you know what you're dealing with uh, we know how much disturbance we can make for uh, for drilling holes uh, we know we've got to rehabilitate those drill pads before we can do more disturbance uh, and we know our limits so it's it's very it's a it's a clear place to uh, things are, are straightforward put it that way and that's why it's ranked number one uh, in the world as the as a resources jurisdiction i mean you would have seen the fraser institute annual um, resources company survey came out uh, two weeks ago and uh, Nevada's pipped WA for the top resources jurisdiction. And, and, and this is one of the reasons why it's just, it's just a, a, an easy place to operate. But in terms of how we got there, I mean, uh, the, uh, Astro had a, had a, had a previous project uh, called Needles Gold. It was in, in the, in Nevada. So that was kind of provided, let, let's call it an understanding of, of how to operate in the state. But uh, when, uh, when Georgina was brought into Astro and Tony and I came over to the business, it was really a strategic decision to explore for lithium claystone deposits in Nevada. And uh, for the, the reasons I outlined earlier, uh, th th we believe that those deposits uh, not only have lower production costs and, and, and you can sell a product for a, for a premium, but it's also easy to explore, uh, relatively speaking. So for those reasons, it was a, it really was a strategic decision to get to, to stay in Nevada and uh, be active in staking these lithium clay projects. So is it, is it correct to say, um, Matt, that the projects were staked by the company, though you didn't acquire them from another, another entity, is that right? That's right. So, so these were all staked on the back of. Uh, we've done all of our homework before stake, staking these um, projects. The 
the, the lithium bearing claystone, which is locally called the Seabit Formation, it outcrops in the hills to the east of, uh, of, the, of the tenements and um, to some extent to the, to the south. Uh, and uh, we knew there was other explorers in the region uh, that were doing work, they'd been drilling, they'd been hitting this claystone undercover. Uh, and uh, we, we, when we ran the ruler over it, we thought, you know, this is a good opportunity, we need to get involved. Fantastic. Um, just a reminder, if anyone wants to shoot any final questions in, please, please do so. Um, question here from Andrew Hector. Where is the Governor Broom project located in WA relative to BHP's Mineral Sands project? Uh, let me see. Uh, let me take it back a bit. Um, so uh, BHP's project was located further west of Governor Broome. I uh, couldn't tell you exactly how many kilometres uh, precisely. Uh, but what I can say is that um, most of Governor Broome, uh, one of the one of the issues with that BHP project was with the pyrite. We actually don't really see that problem so much at, at, um, at Governor Broome. Jack Track has no appreciable pyrite. There's a small amount in some parts of Governor Broome, but it's been shown to be, to be able to be separated cleanly. And so that can be dealt with um, without too much issue at all. Fantastic. Well, look, I think we've we've probably dealt with everything that's come in. Uh, unless we get a final question, I might just hand it back to Tony. Just Tony, we always like to give you the, the last word. Can you give us uh, your 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 thoughts on why why Astro is a, a really great investment and what we can what un, what really is going to drive the value proposition over the coming months? Um. I think it's fair to say, Nick, that 2022 and 2023 um, were years like no other. We saw the world move away from a near zero interest rate environment at record breaking speed, um, which has disproportionately attracted high growth resource companies. Uh, we, 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 need, we need to be patient to date, today uh, with, with building long term value. And I think shareholders need to uh, come along for that ride. But over time, it's not going to happen in the short term. I saw assets that uh, we could get in at a, um, what I saw a value accretive level. In other words, the rewards significantly outweighed the risks associated with those rewards. I wasn't particularly keen on taking a new role at this stage of my life. However, um, I think I got pressurized by a number of investors to do it, and I don't regret it. Um, you will see quite a lot of additional changes with our asset base uh, and some um, additions to our, our projects, as Matt has already alluded to. And I think the next year to two years is going to be extremely exciting. Fantastic, Tony and Matt. Um, I'll just bring up the contacts there. So for anyone listening, um, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to, to Tony in Sydney or Matt in Brisbane or myself. Um, Tony and Matt, thank you very much for your time this morning.